We have a warning for every Melee fanboy who is about to watch this video. Frost Mage is still broken. Yes, even after that huge nerf to Ice Lance, but it's not the only spec you'll need to worry about in Season 1. Today, we will be ranking every ranged DPS from best to worst in Solo Shuffle, including some specs which might be going under the radar. Of course, the new season can mean a lot of chaos, and you don't want to be that guy using the wrong hero talents while your solo shuffle lobby flames you for doing zero damage. To help you out, we've been working behind the scenes for the past three months to test everything on the beta while working with the highest rated players in the game to develop brand new damage courses. You can skip all of the guesswork of the early season and get immediately started with the best PvP guides for over a decade. We're even rolling out brand new updates to our revolutionary add-on which gives you everything you would ever need to climb to Gladiator or even rank 1. Everything we offer is backed up by one simple promise, that you will gain at least 400 rating while using our service. We continue to offer this because skill capped has worked for over a half a million players. If you want to skip the guesswork and get an exclusive early season discount, be sure to visit the links below. First up on the chopping block is Balanced Druid, who have always been pretty good in solo shuffle, but will they hold up? Most boomies will like to play the Elune's chosen hero spec, which centers around Fury of Elune. Fury of Elune has been a staple ability in the Balanced Druid toolkit for quite a while. It is the microburst button involved in every single setup. If Root Beam was peanut butter, then Fury of Elune would be jelly. It's the perfect combo, unless you are British and prefer beans on toast for some reason. Anyway, Elune's Chosen basically just preserves the existing Balanced Druid playstyle with a few improvements sprinkled in. Fury of Elune now includes an AoE explosion at the end of its duration, which actually hits considerably hard. And depending on the Druid's build, Fury of Elune can even sometimes proc on targets with Moonfire of all things. There's even a potential build that centers around Starfire, increasing its damage by an insane 65%, but prevents you from ever entering Solar Eclipse. Sort of awkward, but could be interesting. There were also a few improvements to the Druid class tree, which should help Boomy survivability, especially the new Oakskin talent, which adds some more damage reduction onto Barkskin, and Ursox Spirit, increasing stamina passively while in bear form. These buffs are crucial, since Boomy is one of those specs which tends to get gas pedaled by melee all game, so more durability is always a bonus. On another high note, Cyclone Range is now a whopping 30 yards when playing with the new High Winds PvP talent, since Preservation of Ochre is projected to be one of the best healers. This is a huge plus since it can potentially outrange their heals. The only thing that gives us a bit of concern is damage output. On the beta, balanced druids weren't really as threatening compared to previous iterations of the spec. Blizzard seems to have reduced the damage of spenders universally, which is kind of a problem for the spec who likes to send out five spenders in a row. But for the most part, the win condition is still centered around incarnation, especially at the critical two minute mark of every round. All things considered though, we still think Balanced Druid will be carried by its entire toolkit and should be healthy enough to reach the high tiers. Up next, we have Devastation of Ochre, who is a spec that might surprise people in the early season. On the beta, we were impressed with the Scale Commander spec, which has some of the most badass passives in the game. This hero tree offers mass disintegrate, allowing the evoker to beam multiple targets at the same time. Yes, you heard that right, more beams, more power. At this point, Devastation Evokers probably feel like they are playing an entirely different game. Scale Commander also gives evokers the ability to control their deep breath, causing them to soar around the arena like they are Superman or something. We can't undersell just how good evoker damage was on the beta. In the right lobbies, Devastation can easily top the meters and continues to be a true slot machine spec capable of winning the game with a single random disintegrate with good RNG. After buffs in the middle of Dragonflight, Evoker defense is still quite strong and is now even better thanks to some key buffs coming from hero talents. The biggest question mark for the spec will be how competitive it is into other meta classes. As with Frostmage projected to be the number one caster, Evokers might struggle to keep up when bombarded by roots and limited by their short range. But based on what we saw in the beta, we're still anticipating that this spec will be sleeper OP. So with that in mind, Dev will be soaring its way to a spot right below the highest tier. Augmentation, on the other hand, is a true wild card, both balance-wise and by design. Aug will always be one of those specs that is truly impossible to place accurately on a PvP tier list because so much of its strength depends on the skill level of whoever it's paired with. With the right players and the right comp, Aug is broken, but without good players in your group, you better stick to Mythic Plus. Anyway, for the time being, it seems like Augmentation is leaning towards the Chrono Warden hero tree. This is the identical spec played by Preservation Evokers, and if you know anything about current healer balance, then you should be optimistic in Chrono Warden, if you are an Evoker, of course. 
The spec offers a few key benefits to empowered spells, namely the fact that they will automatically shoot out up to three living flames for free. But the true strength in Chrono Warden lies in Temporal Burst, which is an Omega Broken buff granted every time Tip the Scales is pressed, giving 30% haste, movement speed, and cooldown recovery rate, which diminishes over time. This passive alone is one huge reason why Preservation of Ochres are looking so strong. It essentially gives them a bloodlust every time they want to AoE Klepto some buffs. You purge some Druid Hots and you get a little bonus bloodlust sprinkled in. Temporal Burst is even more broken as augmentation since with Time Skip they're able to tip the scales twice in a much shorter period of time, giving them the potential to have three mini bloodlusts in a single game, ready to beef up their teammates damage. But we will emphasize exactly what we originally said. Augmentation is, by design, a spec that is very reliant on its partners to win. While Devastation might have a slot machine win condition every disintegrate, Aug will be more held back at lower ratings, where players are less likely to utilize its strengths. So by the very nature of being a wildcard spec, we're going to put Augmentation somewhere in the mid-tiers. Before we go over BM Hunter, there is one huge problem. The spec was bugged for almost the entire life cycle of beta. Luckily, all these bugs seem to be fixed, so let's give our wildcard prediction. There is a new talent which looks exciting at first, but might actually be the bane of BM Hunter in Solo Shuffle. It's called Basilisk Collar, increasing pet damage done to the target based on the number of damage over time effects they have. Now, I know what you're thinking. BM Hunter? A dot class? How could that possibly work and how could that possibly be bad? But let's explain. Barbed Shot applies a dot whenever applied, and now Kill Shot does too. Also, Kill Command can now proc Murder of Crows after 5 presses, which technically counts as a dot. Oh, and Dire Beast now can sometimes proc a pet called Fenrir, which applies a bleed. And let's not forget Bloodshed and holy sh BM Hunters are suddenly a dot class in the war within. The good news, all you have to do now as a BM Hunter is train a single target all game from start to finish. The bad news, all you have to do now as a BM Hunter is train a single target all game from start to finish. That's right, because Basilisk Collar, you are now rewarded by just training a single target the entire game by stacking as many dots as possible, which you can only really do on one target at a time. Does this make BM good? I mean, kinda? But not really. Succeeding in solo shuffle often means swapping to a vulnerable target in deep dampening, which is kinda hard to do when you have such a long ramp up time contingent on five different dots. We could see BM become one of those specs that is very oppressive in the right lobbies. If you play with another gas pedal spec who just wants to hit one target all game, then you're probably chilling. If not, you might be screwed. So since the spec is a bit awkward to play in solo shuffle now, and honestly hard to predict, BM will be going in an entirely unpredictable tier. Now we need to talk about Marksmanship, which is probably the best Hunter spec going into the War Within. If you played the end of Dragonflight, this really isn't a surprise. Marks was literally the most popular ranged DPS at all ratings. No, literally, this is Marks at elite ratings and above. What makes Marks good then is basically what makes Marks good now. It is the Hunter spec which does the biggest damage to anyone in the arena at any time. The appeal of playing Marks is exactly the opposite of BM. You want to be swapping. Whether it's hitting someone who just peeked in the open or punishing a healer for overextending, Marks hunters just need to turn their camera and start shooting in a different direction to see results. Marks is one of the lucky few to have two viable hero specs. Sentinel is the more vanilla option between the two, having a chance to proc AoE damage not once, but twice, between random attacks and rapid fire. Now, in case you've been under a rock for the past few expansions, AoE damage is a dual-edged sword. On one hand, it means bigger numbers, and bigger numbers makes us feel good, right? But do you know what doesn't make us feel good? Broken CC. Unless you're playing Diamond Ice, Sentinel just adds one more obstacle in your toolkit, custom designed to break your trap. So, now more than ever, Diamond Ice is your best friend. But your other best friend will be Dark Ranger, which saw some buffs towards the end of the beta cycle. Dark Ranger brings back the fan favorite Black Arrow, which not only does a fair amount of sustained damage by itself, but also makes aimed shots significantly faster. The Gunslinger spec is back and better than ever in the War Within. Dark Ranger also plays into the defensive strength of Sylvanas, considering she did not die for multiple expansions in a row, even though she probably should have. This is due to the smokescreen defensive passive, causing survival of the fittest or exhilaration to proc the other cooldown automatically with a slightly reduced effect. Will this remove all of Mark's defensive flaws? Probably not, but it will make it slightly better into double melee. So with buffs overall, Mark's will be finding itself once again on the high tiers. Now though, it's time for the mages, starting with Arcane. 
Right now, both hero specs are looking competitively viable in different situations. Sun Fury is definitely the more appealing option, at least on paper, as it offers significantly more burst damage, but more importantly gives the mage a cute little bird every time Arcane Surge is pressed, which then dramatically offers a ton of downstream damage with Arcane Blast. If allowed to free cast during these windows, Sun Fury will do a ton of damage, but here you might see a problem. Of course, you should know by now that Arcane is one of those unlucky specs with a single spell school, leaving it very prone to interrupts, which sort of makes it hard to get value from a hero build designed around pressing Arcane Blast of all things. But this is exactly where Spell Slinger comes off the bench. It is better optimized for situations where hard casting is limited, allowing the mage to squeeze out more consistent damage with Barrage. Regardless of hero talents, Arcane Mages have undergone some pretty big structural changes in the War Within. Now Arcane Missiles is only castable with a clear casting proc, which kind of makes it a bit more challenging to juke since Missiles was a reliable precog generator. On top of this, Spell Steel no longer even triggers clear casting, which is sort of a big deal since this was the most efficient filler global in the entire game, making Arcane feel much smoother in a PvP environment. While Arcane was a safety pick for many high-rated mages in Dragonflight, we definitely feel like the spec is relatively weaker in the new expansion. Now more than ever, it is countered by a simple weak aura. As long as players are able to see Arcane Surge light up on their screen and then pop a single defensive or just land one kick, Arcane is still very easy to shut down. As our first mage spec, it will be going into the mid-tiers. Fire Mage, on the other hand, was definitely not looking too hot during the beta cycle. Fire had a pretty rocky time throughout Dragonflight, but was still somewhat competitive and at times borderline OP with a gimmicky flame strike build. No matter what though, throughout Dragonflight the meme was that Fire Mage was a spec that had to blink backwards, using the range advantage and HP boost of Flame Cannon to wizard people down from 50 yards away, while helping counteract the stamina loss of yet another mandatory PvP talent, Glass Cannon. Unfortunately, Flame Cannon was pruned from the game, which means that Fire Mage is, once again, the most frail mage spec in the game, with less stamina and now even less range, making it more exposed to damage at all times. Of course, any defensive nerf could be potentially offset by simply doing big damn, but this is where things really start to get sad. Remember that huge buff to Living Bomb back in Dragonflight? Yeah, the one that literally buffed it by 800%? Guess what? Living Bomb isn't even in the game anymore. Well, kinda. Instead of being a button Fire Mages actually press, Living Bomb is now a proc that does laughably low damage. As far as hero talents are concerned, it seems like Fire Mages are gravitating towards Sun Fury since it means bigger combustions, but for the time being, it doesn't really matter what hero spec is quote best when the base damage numbers are so undertuned. Anyway, until we see more promising data, Fire Mage will be going to the C tier for the season start. Fortunately for all of you mage players, Frost is shaping up to potentially be the best spec in the game. Why? Two words, big damn. Ice Lance was recently nerfed in PvP, but what people ignore is that its damage coefficient is nearly double what it was in Dragonflight. But Ice Lance wasn't the only star of the show, as pretty much every button Frost Mage has feels really good to press. The damage cadence of Frost Mage in Arena is probably as good as it's ever been. In the past, Frost Mage either did too much damage with Instance and too little with Frostbolt and vice versa, but now everything seems to be hitting hard. Most mages seem to be consistently leaning towards the Frostfire Tree, which includes one of the craziest passives in the game. It's called Isothermic Core, which causes Comet Storm to automatically cast Meteor. Yeah, that makes sense, right? Let's just chuck down a massive fireball as a Frost Mage, just for a bit of fun. Let's be honest, whether or not Frost Mage is overtuned right now, it is still a huge comfort pick for a lot of players, and will feel way better into melee compared to any other caster in the game. The ability to randomly root players with Frostbite is even good into other ranged DPS and even healers, giving Frost Mage one of their best matchup spreads going into Season 1. So while Frost might have been absurdly broken on the beta, we're going to bump it down to the a tier after the Ice Lance nerf. Next up is Shadow Priest, who was doing incredibly well at the end of last season, but have they kept up? Ironically, Shadow Priest seemed to be leaning towards the Archon hero tree which is the Shadow Holy Hybrid instead of the Void Weaver spec, which makes way more sense thematically since it centers around summoning a giant void orb thing. Anyway, Archon Priest centers entirely around Halo, with the initial talent causing every cast of Halo to repeat two more times automatically, and then the Capstone talent causing each Halo to ripple back towards the Priest, which means a single cast of Halo will damage and heal every target it hits up to six times. And let's be honest, it looks pretty damn cool. Archon also increases the damage done during Void Form, which along with some other damage increases offered by Halo, gives Shadow Priest an even deadlier burst window to go along with the infamous Stun Silence combo. 
For the meantime, Archon simply makes the most sense for Shadow inside Solo Shuffle, since it simply buffs the main win condition of the spec. Void Weaver, on the other hand, seems to be a bit more niche, focusing exclusively on maximizing damage during these new Entropic Rift windows, where Void Torrent sends a bowling ball of Void to follow the target. The main downside of this spec, at least so far, is that it requires a ton of uptime, which isn't exactly possible as a Shadow Priest. Admittedly, this is the thematic problem with the spec across the board. When left alone to turret damage into stationary targets, Shadow Priest is arguably the deadliest spec in Arena, but more often than not, it finds itself getting bullied by double melee and healers who love mashing Dispel. This might seem like a hot take, but since Shadow Priest seems to have a lot of potential, we're going to put it on the high tiers. Now, as far as Elemental Shaman is concerned, the story is completely different. Let's just put it this way. While we were wargaming on the beta, we considered banning Ellie from our lobbies. Eventually, the spec would see some considerable nerfs, but we still think it's a big threat. Ellie was leaning hard towards the Farseer tree, and we wouldn't expect this to change anytime soon. Farseer was pretty straightforward. The Shaman will periodically summon some dudes called Ancestors, who will copy the Shaman's abilities, mimicking damage spells and even healing. It is possible for the Shaman to summon at least two Ancestors, guaranteed every 30 seconds, thanks to their new combo Primordial Wave with the new Ancestral Swiftness Capstone talent, which can be used to launch out AoE Lava Bursts on up to six targets. These Lava Bursts can then summon their own dudes, which basically means with good RNG, Ellie's can have three or more Ancestors out at once. Now, with that in mind, one big playstyle difference from Dragonflight is the fact that Ellie is more of an AoE spec than anything else. In Dragonflight, the spec was more or less an APM machine, alternating Lava Bursts and Earth Shocks on a single target over and over all game, having a rotation that was almost impossible to do perfectly, at least for any human. Anyway, Shaman also picked up a new defensive on the class tree with Stone Bulwark Totem, which gives them a pretty big shield and additionally have better passive defense through talents on the Farseer tree. Together, these two perks help cover a pretty important weakness from the past. Ellie now even has Bloodlust in Arena, just like Enhancement, which begs the question, why is anyone still playing Enhance in 2024? No offense, of course. Anyway, Elemental definitely has a lot going for it now and will be another spec to join the high tiers. Next up, we have our three Warlock specs, starting with what might be the ultimate noob slayer, Affliction. One huge change going into the War Within is yet another nerf to Rampant Afflictions, which allows UA to be applied to multiple targets, but now decreases its damage by an astounding 60%. This has potentially shifted the playstyle of Affliction to be even more centered around single target burst of all things, resembling an old school Kata playstyle bursting with Haunt and Shadow Bolt. Another big change from the past is that Malefic Rapture is now on the Shadow Flame spell school, offering Affliction Warlock a way to manage Shadow Interrupts. Anyway, the Soul Harvester tree seems to play off the new potential power of a single target Affliction Warlock. This is due to the Necolite Teachings passive, adding not one, but two additional modifiers to Shadow Bolt. On the beta, these bolts were no joke, especially when they were lined up with Haunt. The other hero talent option is called Hellcaller, granting Wither, which is just corruption with more damage. Admittedly, this is the less interesting option between the two specs, but plays more into the traditional dot and rot type playstyle many players are accustomed to. Anyway, Warlock mains should be excited regardless of what hero build they play, as Affliction is once again putting out big numbers with two distinctly different playstyles. It might seem like a hot take, but we're going to be putting Affliction on one of the highest tiers. For Demo Warlocks, things aren't looking quite as hot. First, the good news. Both hero specs were looking pretty playable. On one hand, Demo Warlocks were experimenting with Soul Harvester, the same spec that Affliction was using to get big Shadow Bolts, instead using it to buff Hand of Gul'dan and Demon Bolt, echoing back to an early Shadowlands playstyle. On the other hand, Demo Warlocks can play Diabolist, which simply buffs Tyrant damage. Okay, more good news. This makes Tyrant feel like a real cooldown again. Remember back in Shadowlands when Tyrant was one of the cooldowns to monitor? That's how it feels with Diabolist. Of course, there are still AI problems. The Tyrant sometimes gets lost or confused whenever there's a small stick in its way. But whether Tyrant is OP or not, Demo Warlocks are facing another big problem, skill creep. Players are just way better now and make smarter decisions. They know how to kick or line your Tyrant. They will root your dogs and kill your Observer. Players are simply better at countering demo damage. Couple this with the fact that demo is one of those specs that has to hard cast a lot and continues to lack the ability to actually close out games, and it might be hard for demo to truly dominate the meta in the future. So once again, until we see more data, demo will be yet another spec landing on the low tiers. That brings us to the final spec on our list, Destro. 
Destro is another spec to have a wild ride during the beta cycle, having completely broken damage that was one-shotting people out of the blue. Things have simmered down, with most warlocks playing Hellcaller, which makes the spec super easy to play. This is once again due to the signature ability Wither, which simply replaces Immolate, but is completely instant cast. That's right, instant spammable Immolates, yet another button Destro Warlocks can press while hopping around. Seriously, what is there to cast anymore? Chaos Bolt? But there's a problem. The main downside of Destro damage across the board is that Chaos Bolt damage isn't really that punchy anymore. Remember what we said at the start of this video? Universally, spenders are doing less damage than before. Destro Warlocks are even playing with Soul Fire of all things, waiting on Decimation procs to quickly burst. But on the positive side, another big change is that Infernals are now a 2 minute cooldown, and seeing that Solo Shuffle is a 2 minute bracket, this is a really good thing. Destro is shaping up to fill an almost identical role to Boomkin. Lots of instant damage, good control, relatively tanky, and with a good finisher cooldown. So naturally, we're going to put these two specs on the same tier. Are you excited about the War Within? We definitely are because we spent the last three months on the beta, working side by side with the best players in the game to craft brand new damage courses for the War Within, allowing you to skip the entire learning process while everyone else is lagging behind. We've even leveled up our revolutionary add-on with brand new updates for the War Within, which can set up your UI in a matter of seconds. So to get started with everything you need for the new expansion, be sure to check out the exclusive offer below and learn how you can gain 400 rating risk-free. For now, that wraps it up for this one. Good luck in the new season. See you soon.